Good day. Today's lecture will take us on a journey through time and history, from 60 million years BC to the present day, in just 45 minutes. Our journey starts 60 million years ago during the tertiary period, when the Baltic region was covered with a temperate forest. But before we embark on our journey, let's establish what amber is and what amber is not. It is not fossilised tree sap. It is petrified tree resin. The difference between sap and resin is that sap is a mineral rich nutrient water which flows from the roots to the leaves of a plant, whereas resin flows between the wooden bark of certain tree species. Resin is an oily antiseptic material protecting the tree from infection. Also petrification is the process of mineral replacement during the fossilization process. But whereas all signs of previous life such as footprints and tracks can be considered as fossils, any living organism subject to mineral replacement is considered to be petrified. Amber is considered a gem, but not a gemstone. Gemstones are crystalline in origin, whereas amber is organic, having been created by a living entity. Other common examples of organic gems include pearl, coral and jet. So, back to the start of our journey. 60 million years ago, a huge forest that covered northern Europe, from southern Scandinavia to the Ukraine, and from central Britain to the Ural Mountains, was dominated by a distant relative of modern spruce, fir and pine trees. These trees were most notable for the vast quantities of resin they produced as a natural defence against breakage and subsequent infections. Why the trees in this particular forest produced so much resin is unknown, but climatologists have suggested that prior to the Ice Age, global temperatures soared and this may have increased the amount of forest dwelling animals and more violent storms both of which can damage trees, thus causing production of more healing resin. As already mentioned, resin is a natural antiseptic, the main active ingredients being succinic acid and hydrogen sulphide, which provide the yellow colour. Many species of tree, including spruce and pine, produce resin today. However, most of this is broken down and decays during molecular polymerization. The reason that the Baltic tree is unique is that it formed in the Ice Age and polymerised over millions of years in very low temperatures, so it's impervious to the extreme temperatures and pressures required to convert it into a gem. The closest modern living relative to the ancient amber trees of the Baltic region is the giant kauri tree found in New Zealand, also a prodigious resin producer. So how does amber form? If a tree is damaged by storm, other falling trees, or by burrowing animals, insects or nesting birds, the resin seeps out of any breakage in the bark and upon contact with air starts to set and harden, forming in effect a soft scab over a wound. This allows the bark to heal underneath, protecting the wood from any further damage. Eventually the hardening resin falls to the ground and these semi-solid pieces continue to harden as they become compressed by the weight of soil above. During the petrification process they oxidise from contact with air and also absorb chemicals from the soil both of which affect the colour. The resin remains hidden in the soil, slowly turning into amber through a process of natural polymerization over millions of years. The ancient resin producing forests died out 20 million years ago, at the end of the tertiary period, when the earth cooled and Europe was covered with an ice sheet some places more than a mile thick. This huge ice shelf covered the whole of northern Europe, from the UK and Iceland to Siberia in the far east of Russia. As the planet warmed at the end of the Ice Age, the ice shelf retreated and finally these huge glaciers melted into the newly created bowl that is the Baltic Sea. As the ice retreated north, the glaciers scoured the land, taking with them much of the topsoil containing the ever-hardening resin and deposited this moraine just off the southern coastline of the Baltic Sea. The topsoil from the Baltic forests eventually became the seabed of the Baltic Sea. It's from these rich clay sediments that the majority of amber is found today. Rough weather routinely disturbs the seabed, and because amber is naturally buoyant, once released from the seabed, the amber floats to the surface and is washed ashore. For over 12,000 years, the primary system of obtaining amber was collecting it from the beach. Even today, people go fossicking for amber in the early morning after winter storms along the Baltic coastlines of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Kaliningrad. November is considered to be the best month to hunt uh, for beach amber along the southern shores. During particularly bad weather, these pieces of amber have been carried out of the Baltic and deposits have been found along the east coast of Scotland and as far down as the Norfolk coast in England. Modern science and technology has meant that we don't just rely on bad weather to produce amber anymore. 
We find it by mining clay deposits close to the shore in Poland and the Baltic states. It's also found by shore dredging and as a byproduct when coal mining in Germany, Poland and the Ukraine. The older amber is, the harder it becomes and the better suited to jewellery. Baltic amber is considered older than most amber found elsewhere, being between 20 and 60 million years old. Baltic amber has a rich history, interwoven with the story of Western European civilization from prehistory to the Second World War. The earliest recorded use of amber comes from the early megalithic period, immediately after the last ice age, making amber one of mankind's oldest used gem materials. Throughout much of human history, right up until relative modern times, amber was believed to originate from the Baltic Sea and have a marine origin. This is because historically amber was found among the flotsam and jetsam of the seashore. Amber was also often confused with ambergris, which is the digestive secretion of the sperm whale and is highly prized in the perfume industry. Anthropologists have guessed that the megalithic people believed amber was a gift from the sun god. Most of these people believed the earth was flat and when the sun dipped over the distant horizon it entered the ocean. On occasion pieces of the sun would break off and eventually wash ashore as amber. Compared to pebbles on the beach, amber is relatively warm to the touch. It's also light enough to float in salt water. It's easy to understand how the megalithic people's beliefs would have developed and since these times amber has retained its intrinsic mystical value. Amber could easily be carved and shaped using primitive wood, stone and leather tools, which is why it was originally used for decorative purposes. It develops a rich polished luster by simply rubbing with a coarse leather rag. Amber was the first gem to be used by ancient man for personal adornment. Small amber beads and tokens have been found buried in clay pots at many sites around Europe, including Stonehenge, the belief being that it was sacrificed and buried as a gift to Mother Earth to ensure a good harvest. The above disc was found buried in Denmark. Carbon dating suggests the indentations date back over 12,000 years. Unlike crystalline gems, very little of the rough weight of a piece of amber is lost in the fashioning process. With a crystal gem, such as diamond or sapphire, over 75% of the rough weight can be lost in the cutting process. However, with amber, this figure is normally less than 10%. Generally, the piece is polished and buffed lightly to remove rough edges and then sent straight for setting. As well as its uses as gifts for the gods and for personal adornment, amber was revered medicinally. Throughout its history, amber was ingested in various ways and used as a general cure-all. Among the various ailments amber was considered a treatment for are rheumatism, asthma, gout, jaundice and even impotency. It was powdered and mixed with honey for eye, ear and nose ailments and mixed with water for all forms of stomach ache, although in England it was powdered and mixed with beer. During the Black Death Plague in the 14th century, amber was touted as the only guaranteed cure and its price rose dramatically. We may think of all this being pure superstition, but when we remember its origins as a natural antiseptic, it may not seem that remarkable. In Northern Europe for the last several hundred years, it's been common to give infants amber teething rings as pictured here. Amber pills are still sold in Poland today for stomach aches. Amber is also electrostatically charged and if rubbed against a cloth it will attract light objects of cloth, hair and paper. The ancient Greeks named amber electron from where we get today's word electricity and amber amulets have been worn for thousands of years to combat rheumatism and arthritis. Perhaps amber's most useful historical attribute is that as incense. Pieces too small for ornamental or jewellery purposes were burnt on special occasions. At relatively low temperatures, amber burns slowly and in the process gives off a rich, sweet pine aroma. This burning incense was prized for its cleansing effect on the air and was believed to ward off evil spirits, hence its use in churches. A clue to this early usage is the German and Polish names Bernstein or Bernst Noah, which simply mean burnt stone. One of the earliest literal references to amber is in the Bible as a gift to the infant Christ. Gold, frankincense and myrrh were gifts brought by the three magi. Myrrh is the ancient Hebrew word for amber, in this case as incense. During the ascent of the Holy Roman Empire between 27 BC and the years after the birth of Christ, Rome fought for control of the amber trade and thus the conquest of Northern Europe was primarily undertaken. So as a byproduct of this humble gem, we in Northern Europe gamed Roman civilization, written Latin, Christianity and the ideals of Greek democracy. The Emperor Nero is said to have stated that a single good quality amber carving the size of his thumb was worth two healthy slaves. Weight for weight, it was 200 times as valuable as gold and the single most expensive commodity available on the world market. 
Here we see a carved amber boat, probably carried as a talisman by a wealthy traveller as he sailed the trade routes. Until the 19th century, sailors routinely wore amber as a talisman against drowning, perhaps because of its marine origins and the way it floats. In 1628, the flagship of the Swedish naval fleet, the Vasa, sank in Stockholm Harbour on her maiden voyage. When the wreck of the Vasa was refloated in 1961 and sailed on her own keel back to port after 333 years on the seabed, historians found a large collection of amber artefacts in the captain's cabin. It's believed these were commemorative gifts for the crew to be presented during the maiden voyage ceremonies. Including in the treasure trove were amulets, simply carved pendants, drinking goblets as pictured here, and amber encrusted ceremonial daggers for the more senior officers. Unfortunately, as the ship sank prior to the gifting of these gifts, they remained on the seabed with the bodies of most of the crew. In 1206, the Order of the Teutonic Knights were given the monopoly for the still very lucrative amber trade by Pope Innocent III, calling themselves the Livonian Brotherhood of the Sword. This was a reward for the Knights' endeavours during the Crusades. These knights controlled land from northern Germany to Poland, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, the area that was richest in the source of amber in the ancient world. This made the order extremely wealthy and powerful. Their trading posts became the city-states of the Hanseatic League. This slide is of a Polish woodcutting from the 14th century depicting peasants employed by the Livonian brothers fishing amber in the shallows. As you can see, the watchtower on the top left erected to guard the beach from amber thieves you can also see the fate of the amber thief hanging from the gallows. Trespassing on an amber beach was a capital offence until the 18th century. These pieces of amber being fished look particularly large. The largest single piece of amber found was believed to weigh in excess of 1,200 kilos and was found in coastal marshlands in Denmark in the 19th century. Sadly, it was cut up and did not survive intact. It would have been the size of a small family car and indicating how large the prehistoric trees grew. The wearing of jewellery as personal adornment has only really existed since the turn of the 20th century. Queen Victoria is credited with making the wearing of engagement and wedding rings popular amongst the common man. Where it was once the preserve of royalty and the very rich to wear jewellery, by the 18th century amber had become the gem of choice for bourgeois farmers throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Amber had become an aspirational item to upwardly mobile peasants in rural communities to show their wealth and social standing. The fashion was to wear the largest beads possible. The larger the bead, the greater the social standing. The situation reached ridiculous proportions towards the middle of the 19th century, with farmers' wives wearing necklaces with individual beads the size of golf balls. Amber's popularity was peaked by the film Jurassic Park in 1993. The premise of the film was that within a piece of amber they found a trapped mosquito. Within the mosquito's blood they found preserved DNA strings of the long extinct dinosaurs and opened a film theme park that we all know today. The timing of this film was fortuitous for the price and popularity of amber. Since the fall of communism and the opening of the Eastern Bloc, amber has been through something of a renaissance. It remains the only intrinsic gem of the region and with all the new visitors post-1991, its popularity has soared. Amber's value today is at a 100 year high and rising sharply due to a newfound market in Asia. Chinese and Taiwanese travellers are paying premiums for larger pieces which can be carved into Buddhas and other religious symbols in the same way that jade has been carved for many thousands of years. Since 2010 the price of amber has doubled. Will we see the day soon when amber once again is more expensive than gold? Only time will tell. Of course Jurassic Park was pure fiction but there is a small basis of fact. Amber often contains perfectly well-preserved pieces of flora and fauna from the ancient forests 20 to 60 million years ago. To date, more than 500 extinct insect species and over 2,000 varieties of fauna have been found in Baltic amber. In fact, in 2016, this perfectly preserved dinosaur feather was discovered. Dating back over 100 million years, it's a window to the origins of life on this planet. However, intact fauna is very rare, particularly in amber. They say 1 in 16 pieces contains traces of flora, and only 1 in 5,000 will contain fauna. Any trace of ancient life carries a huge premium, and this is reflected in the price, with museums and curio hunters prepared to pay 100 and even 1,000 times more per piece with any fauna found inside. Interestingly, as a total opposite from traditional crystalline gems, the inclusions in amber are seen as a positive rather than a negative. We hear gemologists and jewellers speak of flaws and inclusions in gems, and for the most part these are considered detrimental to the value, but not so with amber. Each mark 
Each fissure inside a piece of amber is a moment in time, frozen for eternity. The French, who are always so eloquent with language, use a great word for these tiny capsules of prehistoric life. They refer to them as le jardin, or the garden of the gem. Don't expect to find large, perfectly formed insects, animals or flowers inside pieces of amber. Large, easily seen, intact pieces of flora and fauna, neatly centred into a ring or necklace, for a reasonable price, are always fakes. Just like the scorpion seen in this picture. Normally an insect is arranged and glued onto a slice of amber, then a synthetic resin or plastic is poured over it into an oval mould. Most fake amber today is coloured plexiglass or is perspex. Young amber or copal is often passed off as 60 million year old amber, whereas in truth it's no more than 20,000 years old. Another popular fake is ambroid, which is a product made from thousands of small, almost valueless pieces of amber, heated to a point where they soften and then pressed together to form one large piece. One of the most common questions asked is how to spot real amber from fake. There are four simple methods that you can use without having to resort to laboratory equipment. Number one, the electrostatic charge test. Rub the piece of amber against a cloth and it will attract tissue paper or hair. Number two, the salt water test. Drop a piece of amber without any metal setting into salt water and it will float. Number three, the touch test. Amber is a poor heat conductor and as such should feel warm to the touch, more like ambient room temperature. Number four, the hot pin test. Find an inconspicuous spot on a piece of amber and prick it with a hot pin you'll detect the scent of spruce or pine. We're going to round off our amber story today by briefly covering one of history's most enduring mysteries, the Amber Room. The Amber Room was the dream of Queen Sophie Charlotte of Prussia, young wife of Frederick I. She was 33 years old when she commissioned the room in 1701. It was to be the centrepiece of her new Baroque Charlottenburg Palace under construction outside Berlin in the town of Lutzenburg, since renamed Charlottenburg. The room was designed by German sculptor Andreas Schluter and a Danish amber craftsman named Gottfried Wolfram, who had made his fortune manufacturing tinted spectacle lenses from amber. The construction proved to be cripplingly expensive and very time consuming. From 1701 to 1706, Prussia's budget for its entire military was less than Sophie Charlotte was spending on the amber room. Sophie Charlotte did not see the room finished. She died of pneumonia in 1705, aged just 36. Her husband Frederick continued the construction in her memory, but he too did not see it completed, dying in 1713. His son, King Frederick William I, had none of his father's sentimentality, making halting the job his first task as king. The panels of the room that were almost finished were hastily completed, resulting in an amber room only 25% the size it had originally been planned. Rather than admit defeat due to lack of funds, the room was never shown in its intended spot in the Charlottenburg Palace. Instead, it was made ready for shipment to St. Petersburg as a gift to curry favour with Peter I of Russia in 1716. Peter the Great was well aware of this legendary room being created in Prussia and decided a suitable gift was required in return. In polite Russian society, it is still considered unacceptable not to reciprocate a gift with something of equal value. Official court records show that a year after receiving the Amber Room, Peter gave Frederick William 25 giants for his personal bodyguard affectionately known as the Potsdam Giants. Frederick William's father had created an infantry regiment in 1675, consisting only of huge men, known in Prussia as die Lange Kerls, or the Longer Guys, and Peter's gift swelled their numbers. For Peter the Great to record these men as giants when he himself stood six foot eight tall is a testament to their stature. Peter the Great had the room assembled in his St. Petersburg Winter Palace, this opulent gesture of friendship between Russia and Germany would come to serve as a potent symbol of their divisions. Peter had the room assembled in the Hermitage, his new winter palace. At the time it measured 275 square feet, but even with its immense value it seemed somewhat lost inside this incredible building. Peter's daughter Elizabeth I later commissioned a new generation of craftsmen to embellish the room and moved it from the winter palace in St. Petersburg to her new summer abode in Tsarskoye Selo, just outside the city. It was eventually completed at the newly named Catherine Palace during the reign of Catherine the Great in 1770. The completed room was now 600 square feet in size with a total amber weight of 13,000 pounds. And here the amber room remained for 180 years, a jewellery box fit for a czar, until the fateful events of 1941. 
During the Second World War, the German troops were advancing upon Leningrad. The city was under siege for two and a half years and more than a million Russian civilians died, mostly from starvation. The Leningraders' resilience was fundamental in Russia's final victory over Germany. Although they did not manage to take the city itself, the German troops were able to overrun the Sarsko Salo. When the soldiers entered the palace, they first missed the room. Workers had hastily wallpapered over the panels in a vain attempt to hide them. Once discovered, the German troops dismantled the panels into an, of this oversized jewellery box, packed them up in 27 crates and shipped them to Konigsberg in Germany for safekeeping. In January 1945, after air raids and a savage ground assault on Konigsberg, the room's whereabouts were lost. Official records show that 27 crates were stored at Konigsberg Palace, but this was destroyed during an air raid, supposedly destroying the room as it burned. Some say the crates were moved just before the air raid, and there are several eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the crates loaded onto the battleship Wilhelm Gustav, which was torpedoed off Poland in 1945. However, despite exhaustive inquiries by the Russian KGB and their East German counterparts, the Stasi, in 1970 the Amber Room was officially declared as lost. It remains to this day the most expensive work of art ever lost, with an estimated modern day value of between 600 million and 1 billion US dollars. There have been recent stories into the original whereabouts of the room, from a warren of underground bunkers in Poland to a Nazi train full of gold buried in the final days of the war, but none has turned up any trace of the room. The only tangible piece of evidence found to this date is a small mosaic of four pieces of amber discovered as part of an Italian mosaic in 1997. These belong to the family of a German soldier who was part of the Army Group North who dismantled the original room. The pieces were bequeathed to the Russian government and were used as a reference piece to replace the room's construction. In 1979, the Russian president, Leonid Brezhnev, authorised the reconstruction of the Amber Room at Tsarskoye Selo. It was to take 40 German and Russian craftsmen over 24 years to complete the project using only original drawings, a handful of photographs and the memories of one man who had worked as a guard of the original room. The project was beset with financial problems and when the Russian government was almost bankrupted in the late 1990s, it was only the investment of, ironically, the German government which allowed the project to be finally completed, just days before the tricentenary of St. Petersburg. The room was unveiled to the public by Vladimir Putin and the German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder on May 11, 2003. It remains a testament to the talent of a small group of men and women who dedicated a large part of their lives to the completion of this work of art. It contains over 6,000 pounds of amber in 360 different colours and estimated 900,000 individual pieces of amber and is now guarded 24 hours a day by an elite security force. The final question we're always asked is why do we have different colours of amber and what is considered better? There are various colours, typically cognac, honey, lemon, butterscotch and pale green. The opaque butterscotch is caused if the resin contains millions of microscopic bubbles that give the amber a whipped cream consistency. When the resin is still semi-liquid many of the bubbles will escape leaving a fairly transparent material. Some amber pieces will show combinations of both opaque and clear areas. This is commonly found in older pieces of amber and is generally the result of exposed roots and the lower part of the trunk being damaged. Neither one colour nor the other is more valuable, it is just a case of personal taste. The darker amber generally was exposed to the air for longer before being buried under the ice shelf. Different trace elements in the soil and peat in which the amber has spent its formative years also affect the final colour. Green amber is the product of saplings and young trees, their trunks producing pale green resin rather than the golden honey colour of more established trees. In its natural state, green amber is quite insipid, so it is common practice to paint the back of the amber with an iron oxide called potch. Our onboard amber collection is only available for purchase in the duty-free shops. Our amber is manufactured by Arcadius Zimmerman in Gdynia, Poland, one of only 101 manufacturers re recognised and accredited by the International Amber Association. The amber is all from Kaliningrad, Latvia or Lithuania, and we only use lightweight 925 sterling silver with a zero nickel content, so it is hypoallergenic. It is lacquered with a clear tarnish resistant coating, so it will not discolour or oxidise. Each piece comes certified as genuine, 60 million year old Baltic amber. I'd like to finish with this poem from 2000 years ago by Marcus Martial, which sums up for me the great history of this uniquely Baltic gem. A drop of amber from the weeping plant, 
fell unexpected and embalmed an ant. This little insect we so much condemn is, from a worthless ant, become a gem. If you have any further questions about Amber, please see our Onboard Russian Art Specialist, available through the Onboard Boutiques. Thank you.